I'd like to welcome you to Consciousness, Creativity, and the Brain, featuring the distinguished director, David Lynch. I'm David Hodge, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. You know, the partnership between the Alumni Association and the College of Arts and Sciences has brought many people to the campus, but I don't think I've seen anyone make, create more interest and excitement than what we're seeing tonight. And I find it especially interesting given how much time we professors spend inducing stress in students uh, that we should be here tonight. I think we're going in for a memorable evening. Now let me do a couple of uh, housekeeping chores here before we get into the evening overall. First of all, I want to again state that we're very proud of this partnership between the Alumni Association and the College of Arts and Sciences as the main sponsors. But we have a number of other campus partners, including the University Bookstore, the Henry Art Gallery, the Cinema Studies Program, and the School of Art. Well, we are here tonight to learn from this astonishing filmmaker, from quantum physicist, Dr. John Hagelin, and from neuroscientist, Dr. Fred Travis. This is a stunning example of interdisciplinarity in the pursuit of creativity. And in this pursuit, the college, the university, and Mr. Lynch are united. We are all committed, committed deeply to developing the creative potential of every student. As a social philosopher, Arthur Kessler noted, creativity is a learning process where the teacher, teacher and pupil are located in the same individual. A creative life cultivates areas of profound curiosity and explores a wide variety of perspectives. This is at the heart of a liberal arts and sciences education. Now we often make the assumption that real creativity is an exceptional capacity limited to exceptional people. But this view is profoundly mistaken. In reality, we are all born with tremendous creative potential. And we are here tonight to hear more about how to engage that cre creativity from these exceptional people. To introduce our speakers and to serve as a master of ceremonies this evening, I would like to introduce Bob Roth, Vice President of the David Lynch Foundation for Consciousness-Based Education in World Police. Please help me in welcoming Bob Roth. It's great to be here. David has been traveling all over the country, universities, college campuses, and the organization and the warm welcome from the University of Washington has been absolutely exceptional. So thank you very, very, very much. The best, so thank you. David Lynch has a passion for what he calls the doing. He has a passion for filmmaking. He has a passion for painting, for sculpture, for music, photography. And he also has a passion for the big ideas that he captures deep within his awareness that inform that passion for doing, that has created a body of work unprecedented. In fact, the Guardian in the, U in the United Kingdom called David Lynch the greatest living filmmaker today. He's created Eraserhead. Elephant Man, Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks, Wild at Heart, Lost Highway, The Straight Story, Mulholland Drive, and sometime soon, Inland Empire. But David has a passion not just for the doing and the thinking, but he has a passion for the being, for diving deep within himself and unlocking and exper unlocking that flood of creativity that informs those ideas, that informs that doing. Tonight we're very fortunate that David has agreed to talk, to answer your questions about doing, ideas, and diving within, but he's not going to talk. You have to ask the questions. He has no prepared statement. There's a microphone there and a microphone there, and you are welcome to stand right now and ask the questions that you want about film, 
about consciousness, about creativity and the brain. David will be joined in also by Dr. John Hagelin, a renowned quantum physicist, and a little bit later by Dr. Fred Travis, an equally renowned neuroscientist and brain researcher. So to welcome David and John, I would like to read a beautiful, beautiful statement that Professor Dudley Andrew wrote in welcoming David Lynch to Yale about a month ago. We welcome you, David Lynch. We welcome your fearless look full in the face. The way you looked at the face of the elephant man to get inside. We welcome you, the teller of stories that, whether straight, curved, or twisted, dive, drive deep and downward into the cistern of social experience. We trust you among American filmmakers, for you don't manipulate. Instead, you imagine and discover. We are proud that an individual can have pursued this hard, this twisting highway in the spiritually desiccated and hostile environment of Hollywood. And we are here to learn how you kept your bearings, kept your vision, and kept sharp your probing imagination in that smog of money and illusion. What does it mean to direct? Does it mean to administer, to engineer? You are not an engineer of emotion. As a filmmaker, you are rather a searcher of self and society. Well, here we are, David, right now at this minute. Direct our attention beyond what we know. We're listening intently. Welcome. Would you please welcome David Lynch and Dr. John Higlin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say hello to the beautiful room right next door, the overflow room. And as Bobby said, um, I will try to answer questions on film or consciousness or meditation. So if you want to get things rolling. <laughs> how do you work with your actors? How do you, how do you approach, say, a scene? Do you do it through concept, or uh, do you rely on method acting? Uh, OK. Um, for me, the idea says everything. And if you catch an idea, the whole thing is there in the idea. Now, sometimes you catch just a little fragment, but you start falling in love with this little fragment, and it tells you something that you fall in love with. And then, if you are lucky, more come and swim in and hook together, and a story starts unfolding, and the characters start unfolding. So you go by the idea. And when I work with actors, I um, start um, a rehearsal, and it doesn't matter where it starts. Uh, you just rehearse the scene, a scene that defines the characters in your mind the most. And wherever it is, after it's over, if it's far, far away, you just go and start talking to the actors. And you talk to them, and then you have another rehearsal. And the next one is closer. And you're, all, you're always trying to think of that original idea, the mood, the, the character, and talking, rehearsing, talking, rehearsing, pretty soon it comes and the actors say, okay, I got it. And once they catch that drift, they're rolling down the line with you. And they're flowing with uh, the things that were in that original idea. That's how it, how it works. Hello. This lecture was billed as being on Transcendental Meditation. I'm a fan of your movies, but I, n I never knew that this was an interest of yours. Did I miss a message in your movies? How do, how do your movies relate to this lecture? Pardon? <laughs> did, I, did you miss what? Was there a message about transcendental meditation in your movies? No. <laughs> 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 
Transcendental Meditation I've been doing for 32 years. And uh, the Transcendental Meditation is a mental technique that allows a person, any human being, to dive within and experience subtler levels of mind, subtler levels of intellect, and transcend and experience this ocean of pure consciousness within, at the source of thought. So Transcendental Meditation is a technique. It's like a vehicle that gets you there to that ocean of pure consciousness. And the experiencing of this ocean of pure consciousness, the experiencing of it enlivens it, it unfolds it, and it starts to grow. So consciousness starts to grow in the human being. And consciousness is that sense of self. It is the self. It's that ability to understand. It's that ability of awareness, wakefulness, inner happiness. And it's an ocean of creativity, intelligence, love, harmony, coherence, and power and energy. It's the most beautiful ocean to dive into, and it's within every human being. Then, after you do this, with Transcendental Meditation, you meditate once in the morning, once in the evening, and you go about your business. But the joy of doing increases like I can't tell you. And as you expand this container of consciousness, you can catch more ideas. Understanding grows so you can understand the thing more, more and more and more. Creativity, kind of problem solving, intuition, all these things start growing. And it's money in the bank for the filmmaker because <laughs> you, you, can, you can see a thing more clearly. And it sounds strange. Well, you enjoy the doing, that's very nice. I enjoy the doing too, I enjoy the doing too. But I used to think I enjoyed the doing, but the side effect of experiencing this consciousness and growing in that, the side effect is negative things start to recede. And this is unbelievable. I had this anger when I first started, and I used to take this anger out of my first wife. And two weeks after I started meditation, she came to me and she said, what's going on? And I was quiet for a while because it could have been any number of things she was referring to. <laughs> and she says, I said, what is it? And she says, that anger, where did it go? It lifts. Anger, depression, sorrow, fear, anxiety, stress, all these things that will kill us start to recede. It doesn't happen overnight. But it's a magical, magical ocean of consciousness and it's pure bliss. Bliss, they say, is the sweetest nectar of life. And when you dive in, the splash of this is bliss. And that starts growing. And that's inner happiness. I'm talking a long time. But the thing that got me meditating was two things. The word enlightenment and the, and the phrase, true happiness is not out there. True happiness lies within. And in that phrase, they, d they don't tell you where the within is, nor do they tell you how to get there. So I always thought of it as a kind of a mean phrase, but with a, with a ring of truth. And I would think about that. And we always look for happiness out there, and we get it. But it starts going away. It's changing. We live in a world of change. It starts changing. Then we look for something else, and we look for something else. When you dive within, that true happiness is there. It's a pure ocean, huge, unbounded ocean of it. And that stuff starts growing. It's, it's like a strength. It's like so beautiful. It's bliss. Physical, emotional, mental, spiritual happiness starts growing from within. And all those things that used to kill you 
In the, in the film business, there's so much pressure. There's so much room for anxiety and fear. This, is, this makes life more like a game, a fantastic game. And creativity can really flow. And it's an ocean of creativity. It's the same creativity you'll hear from Dr. John Hagelin that creates everything that is a thing. And it's us. In Vedic science, this ocean of pure consciousness is called Atma, the self. Know thyself. What is that? You don't know yourself by looking in the mirror. You don't know yourself by sitting down and having a talk with yourself. It's there, within, within, within. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. I just first wanted to say what a pleasure it's been to meet your warm and lively daughter, Jennifer, at the Twin Peaks Fan Festivals up here in the summertime. Um, she is a warm and lively girl. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is, uh, in Twin Peaks, I'm wondering if you recall the moments when you first thought of the idea of these realms called the Red Room and the Black Lodge, and then once they once you knew that they were going to be in the series, how you developed, went on to develop what their nature would be. I could tell you this uh, story when it first happened. It was a summer day, and I was at a laboratory called Consolidated Film Laboratories in Los Angeles. And we were editing the pilot. And we had finished for the day, and we'd gone outside, and it was around... 6.30 in the evening. And there was cars in the parking lot outside the editing room, and I leaned up my hands on the roof of one car, and it was very, very warm. It was not too warm, but nicely warm. And I was leaning there, and the, um, the red room uh, appeared, and the backwards thing appeared, and some of the dialogue appeared. <laughs> so that was a very lucky thing. <laughs> and how, how things like this fit in, I told this story last night um, about um, how you, you just pay attention to things and, and an idea will come along in the strangest way. And it's the same thing with Twin Peaks. Maybe some of you heard this story before, but um, in Twin Peaks, there was, a, uh, there was a guy, Killer Bob, and he was played by a character named Frank Silva. And Frank was never destined to be in Twin Peaks, never in a million years. And uh, we were shooting the pilot and we were in Laura Palmer's home and Frank was the set dresser. And he was in Laura Palmer's room moving some furniture around. And I was in the hall underneath the fan. And a woman said, Frank, don't move that dress. Don't, don't lock yourself in the room. And this picture came of Frank in the room. And, and I went running in and I asked Frank, I said, are you an actor? He said, well, yes, I happen to be, because everybody in L.A. and everywhere is an, a <laughs> is an actor. So I said, Frank, you're going to be in this scene. And I, I, there was a pan shot in that room, and two times I did it without Frank, and then one time I had Frank frozen at the base of the bed. But I didn't know what it was for or what it meant. That evening, we went downstairs, and we were shooting Laura Palmer's mother on the couch. And she was laying there in sadness and torment, and she suddenly sees something in her mind and bolts upright. Now, Sean, the operator, he had to turn the wheels and follow her face as she bolted upright. And it looked to me he did a perfect job as she bolted upright and screamed. And I said, cut, and it's perfect, beautiful. And Sean said, no, 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 uh, there's, 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 it's not. I said, what is it? He said, there was someone reflected in the mirror. And I said, who was reflected in the mirror? And he said, Frank was reflected <laughs> in the mirror. So things like this happen and make you start dreaming 
and one thing leads to another, and a whole other thing opens up. Hi, um, I apologize to, to you and everybody that I have to uh, bring the uh, bring this discussion a little bit down to earth. Uh, I had a question about film financing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> since you um, started your career, uh, there's been a lot of changes in the industry, and um, it's become more difficult to finance um, non-mainstream, uh, non-blockbuster cinema. Um, I'm wondering um, how this affects you, your creativity. Uh, it's how easy it is for you to pitch your ideas and your working methods, as, as you've been describing them. Um, and uh, what you think the situation is for directors like you or, or Woody Allen, who have to go often even to uh, sources abroad, like Canal Plus, to get financing. How does that affect both you and the future of alternative film? I love uh, Canal Plus. <laughs> and I love the French, because they're, they're the, the biggest film buffs and, and protectors of cinema in the world, in my opinion. And uh, they really look out for the filmmaker and, and the rights of a filmmaker and believe in Final Cut. And, and so I've been very lucky that I've been in with some French companies that have, that have backed me. At the studios in LA, if you're just starting out, you're not gonna get Final Cut, which is the biggest absurdity in, in one of the largest absurdities in life. The biggest absurdity is killing human beings in the name of peace, <laughs> in, in my mind. But this is a, a, an absurdity, a little less, but still an absurdity. <laughs> when you are a painter and you paint a picture, it's your picture. Nobody comes in. The, the artist would, you know, throw that person out in two seconds to say, I don't like this blue or I don't like this, <laughs> or we, we've gotten some reactions from some people and we want you to change this. <laughs> So it's um, a very big sadness when you don't have final cut. It's not your film. How could you even start a project without it? I did that once on Dune, and it was a huge, huge sadness because I felt I sold out, and the film was a failure at the box office on top of that. If you do what you believe in and you have a failure, that's one thing. You can still live with yourself, but if you don't, it's dying twice. It's very, very painful. Now, here's the thing. When this bliss comes up inside, it's not as painful. You can ride through things like this and live through it. But it's, it's killed a lot of people. It's made them not want to make a film again. So what I think is happening, two things. There are lots and lots of tax you know, things going these days for film financing. Um, there's lots of people out scrambling for money and people trying to put packages together to get you your money. And the price of film is coming down and down because we're in the digital world. And so more and more and more uh, filmmaking is in the hands of more and more people because it's getting cheaper and you can do fantastic things in digital video. This l film I'm working on now, I'm not shooting film. For me, film is dead and I'm shooting with a, so a Sony PD-150 uh, mm -hmm. cameras. Mm -hmm. So it's more freedom, less expensive, available to more people, and then it's, it's, you're in control of it. And when your film is finished, before it's finished, you can try to get financing. During the process, you can show some things, maybe try to get something. Finish the film, and there it is. If someone really you know, loves it, they're going to help you get it out. And there's so many delivery methods now. The video iPod is unfortunately a tiny little picture, but it's here. And you know, and, and that is uh, one more th way to see um, cinema. Besides, there's the big screen, DVDs, home stuff, and now the iPod. So it's, there's many ways to skin a cat. I, I just, <laughs> just to follow up slightly on that, I mean, but is there ever a case where maybe having obstacles like financial obstacles can in, maybe enhance or, or, or spark creativity for you? Yes, restrictions sometimes get the mind going. If you've got tons and tons of money, maybe you relax and figure you can throw money at any problem and you don't have to think so hard. But restrictions, sometimes um, you come up with very creative, inexpensive ideas. Most of filmmaking is common sense. 
If you stay on your toes and think how to do a thing, it's right there. And, what I said before, this ocean of pure consciousness within, an ocean of solutions, an ocean of solutions. Intuition is like a solution. Intuition is seeing the solution, seeing it, knowing it, knowing something, an ocean of knowingness, knowingness. You experience it, it's, it's a beautiful, unbelievable, just knowingness, pure, vibrant knowingness, bliss. Solving problems, way easier you go through life. Hello. Um, a bit of advice from you, can I ask? Uh, I try to make films on a small scale, and when I have images and glimpses that pop into my head that I have strong emotions for, like you're saying, the Red Room, I worry that when I try to put it into film that it's going to lose some feeling, and I was just wondering how, how you take those and you put them into a story. I tell you exactly how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got the idea, right? You got the idea. And so now you're going to translate that to film. And so the idea tells you to build this red room. And so you start thinking about it. Wait a minute. You say, the walls are red, but they're not hard walls. And then you think about it. They're curtains. And they're not opaque. They're translucent. And already you say, whoa. And then you put the room, you put these curtains there, and then you think, but the floor, it's, it's not, it's, it needs something. And, and you think about the idea, and it had a, th had a th thing. It was all there. And you do this thing on the floor. And then you start thinking, and you start remembering the idea more. You know, you start, and you try some things, and then you suddenly you make some mistakes, but you rearrange some things, and you get some stuff, and, you f and it feels like that idea felt to you. Now you, you've done it, but you had to do those things. Don't even worry about it. But worry is like fear, and those things start lifting. And that's a sense of freedom. I call it the suffocating rubber clown suit. <laughs> <laughs> the suffocating rubber clown suit of negativity. <laughs> this starts dissolving. Your clown suit starts dissolving, and you have freedom. Um, I, I have a question about Twin Peaks. It was such a unique television experience. I mean, you compare it to what's on television today, whether it's situation comedies or ER or whatever the case might be. And I wonder, what was the process like in actually getting something like that on television? Because I compare it to what's on television today, and it's just so unique and so unusual. It was a different time. <laughs> and um, so... Uh, the, in those days, a continuing story was much more acceptable than a continuing story now. And the reason is, now they do these polls, and they found out that um, people don't watch every single week, and they may watch two times a month. So they lose their way in a continuing story, and they drop away from the show. Since they're selling ads, they don't want people to drop away, so they've decided that the continuing story is not so good. And uh, they go with a closed ending. The, the thing about Twin Peaks was, I don't know quite how they decided to let it become a pilot. But because they let something become a pilot doesn't mean they're going to make it into a series, as you all know. Uh, so it got that far, and even then, they didn't really know. So they send these things to a place, I think, in Philadelphia. And they have people, you know, watching these things and grading them. And somehow it got a kind of a good score, <laughs> but not spectacular. And I don't know what really happened between that time and the time it aired, but it got, um, it just, I don't know what happened. It just got a huge, 
huge share that opening night. Um, you were talking about meditation, uh, using it to obtain bliss and... You're using um, it to what? Obtain bliss and solve problems and um, have the flow of creativity. And I meditate, but I also find that I obtain that more through dreaming and would you how would you relate meditating to dreaming and um, do they have a correlation in your to not, you or would not you say not really um, dreamings are dreams are dreams a dream is a state of consciousness dream state and waking state and uh, sleeping state meditation is the, ex the experience of transcending they in research have found a fourth way the physiology works. It's, it's a fourth state of consciousness, the transcendental consciousness, transcending. It's unique. It's not like dreaming. It's not like waking. It's not like sleeping. It's unique. And I, I, I didn't know what it was going to be. I just knew I wanted it. And I went down to the center where they, uh, I learned, and you get a mantra. And you, you're, you learn how to use the mantra. A mantra is a very specific sound, vibration, thought. And you sit comfortably with your eyes closed and start this mantra. So I went into a, taken into a little quiet room to do my first meditation. I sit down, close my eyes, start that mantra, and boom. It was like I was in an elevator and they snipped the cables. Just down into pure bliss, so familiar, but so unique, so powerful. And I, I was just in there, and, and the teacher came and she, and she said, it's time to come out, it's been 20, I said, it's been 20 minutes? And she shh, because other people were meditating. And I, it's, <laughs> I just was so beautiful. And this beautiful process unfolds more and more and more, but then, if you love dream logic, and I love that idea of dream logic, you can, you can understand or catch that drift more. And you can still, you appre the appreciation for, for things grows. The understanding and appreciation and clarity of things grow. So you can, you can uh, uh, appreciate what you used to appreciate more and even appreciate what you didn't even like before. It's the weirdest thing. Sort of like you just start, can't believe you're sort of appreciating uh, that thing. You may not want to do that thing, but you sort of have a, a, a it's okay, it's a kind of cool or whatever, you know what I mean? Uh, let's say you have a talk with yourself and you discover the root cause of one of your most troublesome problems. What do you do with that information once you've acquired it? You, you've discovered the root cause yeah. of one of your worst problems. Yes, like a really bad habit or something. Similar. It doesn't make it go away because you discovered it. Right. <laughs> you just know about it. And, um, but that's halfway there. And um, like they say, knowing that you have a treasury in your basement is pretty important. If you didn't know, you would never find it. And so knowing that, then you can make a choice to go down into the basement and get your treasury. And so, but the problems, wishing them away and um, talking about them, for me, doesn't make them go away. It's like the thirsty man with the glass. He needs water and the imagination is just doesn't cut it. And wishing doesn't fill the glass up. You gotta give them water. And then watch what happens, the thirst is quenched. And, and I, how I'm saying, it, it's over and over again, but it's sort of what this night is about. Um, there is this place that we can dive to. And that problem, you know about it or you don't know the real root cause of it, it can dissolve. You don't have to be stuck with it. You don't have to go through life with one size consciousness. Consciousness can expand. And it brings so much good things with it, so much. And information is information. And if your consciousness, if you have a golf ball size consciousness, 
you can, you can cram it with this stuff, but the ball doesn't grow. The ball grows. Understanding, easy to take in, fun to take in information, thirsty for knowledge, thirsty for knowledge, the container's growing, understanding. And bliss all along the way, problems are going. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing. Thank you. Mr. Lynch, welcome to Seattle. It's good to be here. My name is Kim, and I am personally delighted that you're here talking about TM. Um, a couple questions. One is, I've been to your website on your organization and the grants that you're doing for college students to be able to, to uh, learn TM as a way to better their academic performance. Um, and I'm very interested in that aspect of why you're here tonight. Um, I am a struggling student, financially as well as academically. And I very much want to learn Transcendental Meditation, and I'm wondering how does one go about applying for that scholarship? And is it limited to specific institutions, or is there some variance in that? There's, there's two things. Uh, this uh, David Lynch Foundation for Consciousness-Based Education and World Peace is a new foundation. Uh, we've raised money and given money to seven uh, inner city schools and um, we're now going out, not know, even knowing what we'd find, to universities. Uh, seven on the East Coast and six on the West Coast. And to see if, if people are even interested in it. And to promise, if they are, we're going to try to raise the money to give scholarships to people who want to start. N not only for um, a... Uh, a growth of consciousness for those people, but because we are like light bulbs, and the consciousness is, you can ramp up this light of consciousness by experiencing it. And light, like, like light bulbs, we can enjoy that l brighter light of consciousness within, but radiate it. And the principle is, if you go into a room where somebody's had an argument, it's not a very good feeling. You go into a room where somebody's beaming out bliss, it's a beautiful feeling. And the key to peace is in this. If there were 10,000 you know, new meditating students, it would affect this country. It would be like a wave of peace. It's harmony, coherence, real peace. And that light of, of consciousness in the individual, it drives negativity further and further away. In the world, it can do the same thing. So it's um, for any student that wants to start, this foundation is trying to raise money for that. Okay. I think now Bobby Roth would like to introduce uh, Dr. John <coughs> Haglund, my friend and one of the world's greatest quantum physicists. And I'll be back oh. afterwards to answer more <coughs> questions. Dr. John Hagelin <clears throat> is a renowned quantum physicist, educator, author, and public policy expert, and president of the David Lynch Foundation for Consciousness-Based Education and World Peace. Dr. Hagelin has conducted pioneering research at CERN, the European Center for Particle Physics, and SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center and is responsible for the development of a highly successful grand unified field theory based on the superstring. His scientific contributions in the fields of electroweak unification, grand unification, supersymmetry, and cosmology include some of the most cited references in the physical sciences. Dr. Hagelin received his PhD from Harvard University he is currently director of the Institute of Science, Technology, and Public Policy and professor of physics at Maharshi University of Management. And Dr. Hagelin is now working in Washington, D.C. to establish a much needed, long overdue University of World Peace. Would you please welcome Dr. John Hagelin.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be here. I'm not normally shy of public speaking, but David Lynch is a very tough act to follow in many ways. He's got this million dollar coiffure, which <laughs> makes some of us feel follically challenged. <laughs> and he speaks with such beautiful poetic lucidity about an experience of pure being transcendental consciousness, which is often very, very tough to describe. I wanted to just share a few scientific perspectives on what this experience is, noting that this experience of unity at the basis of life's apparent diversity is not a new experience. It is the core experience of every major tradition of knowledge and every major spiritual tradition on Earth. Is this field of unity fact or fiction. From the standpoint of modern science, we can now corroborate the scientific truth of unity. In fact, if I had to describe in a sentence what the conclusion of 300 years of modern scientific research is, it's that the universe is superficially complex, but fundamentally simple, superficially diverse, but fundamentally unified. As we scratch deeper and deeper beneath the obvious surface of life, past the cellular and molecular and atomic and nuclear and subnuclear domain of quarks and leptons and electroweak unified and grand unified and super unified scales, surface diversity, stage by stage, transforms into fundamental unity. The four forces of nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces, superficially diverse, are fundamentally one. And all the particles on which they act, the quarks and leptons, are also one. So in the context of today's so-called superstring theories, all of these fundamental forces and particles that comprise the universe are just ripples on one universal all-pervading ocean of existence, ripples on a unified field. Its mathematical understanding of the fundamental unity is a very creditable and fascinating achievement of modern theoretical physics, but this understanding of unity is not reserved to a handful of mathematical physicists. Again, it is really a cherished experience with long-developed traditions of meditation that have been refined over the ages to make the experience of this fundamental unity as efficient as possible. In a nutshell, a meditative state, the meditative process is one of turning the attention within, normally directed outward, but turning the attention within to experience earlier stages in the development of a thought, or finer levels of the thinking process, subtler levels of mind, corresponding to the experience of subtler levels of nature. Then at the culmination of that inward march of the mind, the subtlest impulse of thought is transcended and this field of pure wakefulness, pure abstract, unbounded consciousness is what remains, the self, pure subjectivity, wide awake within itself. And there's one other way of understanding this process, which I think is very helpful. In waking consciousness, from the moment we wake up, the moment the alarm goes off, the moment we realize we're late for class, the whole <laughs> <laughs> sequence of events throughout the day is simply the awareness of one thing after another until we cla collapse into sleep at night. So in waking consciousness, this broad comprehension becomes sharply focused on particular objects of experience. This thought, this emotion, this object, that object. Meditation is a process of taking that sharply focused comprehension and allowing it to retire, to relax, and to expand to comprehend bigger and bigger wholenesses, bigger and bigger wholenesses, bigger and bigger wholenesses until unbounded awareness the direct cognition of the wholeness or unity of life is perceived. Not surprisingly, this 
mode of experience, which is absolutely the opposite of waking consciousness, which is, again, narrowly focused, sharply localized attention versus this unbounded awareness. That unbounded awareness has its own style of brain functioning. In a few minutes, we're going to see a very brave student is going to come up here. Let us take a look under the hood, so to speak, at what is happening when he sits and meditates for a few minutes in front of an audience of about a thousand people. <laughs> and uh, you will see a complete transformation in the functioning of the human brain. And that transformation, most striking transformation, is described by what is called global EEG coherence, which means the entire brain begins to function synchronously, in concert. Now, normally the brain electroencephalogram, the electrical activity of the brain, is measured at different points of the scalp corresponding to different areas of the brain and personality. I don't know if any of you have ever had a chance to look at your own EEG profile, but it's depressing. <laughs> it's like there's no obvious intelligence in there, no coordination, no communication between different areas of the brain and personality. And really, mathematically, it's really very much like an orchestra. Before the conductor takes the stage and the individual instruments are warming up, sawing away at their instruments without any obvious attempt to coordinate their activity. And what's the result? Sort of a cacophony of discordant sound. Then the conductor steps up to the podium, raises the baton, and instantly this cacophony of discordant sound is transformed into flowing music. The difference between a cacophony of discordant sound and music is the integrated functioning of the orchestra or in this case, the integrated functioning of the brain, where the whole brain is engaged and the whole brain functions in concert. So what? Well, as an educator, this is itself an educational discovery of the foremost magnitude. Why? Because EEG coherence, orderly brain functioning, correlates with rising IQ, increased intelligence, increased creativity, improved learning ability, short-term and long-term recall, increased psychological stability, improved emotional maturity, enhanced moral reasoning, more alertness, faster reaction time. Everything good about the brain depends on its orderly functioning. And now orderliness of brain functioning through these technologies of consciousness, meditation, orderly brain functioning can be systematically, longitudinally developed in any student of any age. And that's remarkable to see students become noticeably brighter, noticeably more intelligent, noticeably more creative, measurably so, month by month, year by year. And it obsoletes what has been a depressing philosophy of human development. The principal view of human potential is that you know, we peak in some respects at about 12 years of age where the neuronal connections are maximum and then we start to undergo a slow and torturous decline in raw intelligence with a substantial shrinking of our gray matter by the 30s, precipitous shrinking of the brain by the 40s. Now, when you get to be 51, we like to say, well, we, we more than make up for that with our maturity and experience and wisdom. But the whole thing is pathetic and fortunately <laughs> wrong. <laughs> The brain is remarkably plastic and malleable. It has the capability of forging new connections and growing in intelligence and competence throughout life. So I believe that the, this meditative experience or holistic experience, or sometimes called traditionally spiritual experience, is crucial in education for the balanced, full development of the human brain. Now, the problem with education as it exists today is it focuses on specific facts of knowledge. It's really all about content, fact-based education. And if you're studying physics, that engages this part of the brain, or mathematics, this part of the brain, or the arts and music, this part of the brain. But nothing in the curriculum today engages the total brain and develops the brain holistically. As a result, our naturally broad comprehension, which we have as young children, have this global EEG coherence, but they start to learn, it's a good thing, to focus that broad attention, first to recognize the face of their mother, and then later to 
recognize and manipulate the environment more and more effectively. And then in school, you gain better grades by focusing more and more sharply until you get to the master's level where you start to realize you're learning more and more about less and less. <laughs> At the doctoral level, you become the world's greatest expert in nothing. <laughs> My doctoral dissertation is called Weak Mass Mixing, CP Violation and the Decay of B-Quark Mesons. How many have read it? <laughs> yes, almost everybody. The specialization isn't the evil. The evil is not taking a few minutes with a little bit of guidance to withdraw that comprehension temporarily from those narrow boundaries of perception and learning, to expand that narrow-minded nationalism and narrow self-centeredness, expand it to comprehend greater and greater wholeness, to become more global in our thinking, global citizens with unbounded awareness and maximum breadth of comprehension, that's what we lack in education. And it's so easy to add, and adding it develops the brain. Unlike any other activity, whether it's waking, dreaming, sleeping, hypnosis, transcending is unique. One more thing before I introduce Fred Travis, I want to introduce the term enlightenment and what it means in this context. Enlightenment is sometimes called self-realization. Realization of the self. What is the self? Well, as David says, you don't learn about the self by looking in the mirror. We are not our bodies. In fact, what we are, ultimately, is our inner subjectivity, that which experiences our own consciousness, which is the only thing, as abstract as it is, and the only reason it's abstract, is we don't experience it in waking consciousness. It's there in waking consciousness, so we wouldn't be awake. But in waking consciousness, you sacrifice the experience of that unbounded awareness, bliss consciousness, for this. So that unbounded awareness is the only thing about us that has never changed. Our bodies change for the worse, our friends change, our beliefs change, our jobs change, our spouses change. The only thing that has not changed that for which, by which we know we're the same person today, that we were as children, is our own subjectivity the self. Now the problem with waking consciousness and the reason it's called bondage as opposed to liberation or enlightenment is that we gain the experience of specific objects at the expense of the self. So say you're sitting and enjoying mashed potatoes and gravy. If you like mashed potatoes and gravy that's all right but you have to at least recognize that at that moment that's all your life is. <laughs> it's the nature of waking consciousness to be completely overshadowed by that objective experience. If you're eating okra, pickled eggplant, life is a disaster. <laughs> so the important thing is the experience of one's unbounded self whose nature is bliss, pure creativity, pure intelligence, pure energy, pure alertness, and become so familiar with that non-changing aspect of oneself that it is never lost. You never lose it. And that's just you know, this ability to transcend and experience unbounded awareness. You learn that in a few days. You master it in a few months. What takes a little more time is getting so accustomed to that inner peace, inner bliss, that you're never lost to it again. It's sticky, a sticky experience. So if you're sound asleep, if you're under anesthesia, if you're in dreams, you never forget, you're never lost to the experience of your unbounded self. That's called self-realization, enlightenment. And as David said, it brings tremendous strength, really invincibility in a sense. Because whether you're experiencing the okra or the mashed potatoes, you're never lost to the unboundedness of oneself, which is bliss, stability, peace. So I would like very much to introduce a great brain researcher, probably foremost researcher in the world on brain development and meditation, Dr. Fred Travis, and a very brave student volunteer, to show us the best we can in just a few moments 
the qualitative and quantitative change in the functioning of the brain which distinguishes the experience of pure consciousness or global EEG coherence with any other state of consciousness. And then we'll invite David back to answer more questions on the meditative experience, creativity in the brain. Please welcome Dr. Fred Travis. So now we're going to be looking at this very abstract idea. Lights down, please. Understand this very abstract idea of an underlying field of intelligence in terms of concrete functioning of the brain. The reason we're able to do that is brain functioning shapes experience. When we have a good night's rest, we wake up. There's no problem too big for us to solve. <laughs> On the other hand, we wake up, we didn't get a good night's sleep. It's sometimes hard even to remember what day it is. <laughs> now, this relation goes the both ways. Not only does the brain underlie experience, but every experience we have changes the brain. Right now, what's happening, light is going through your eyes, it's streaming to the back of your brain, sounds going through your ears, it's creating this cascade electrical activity over your brain. Hundreds of thousands of brain cells are as if shaking hands, creating this delicate network. And it's through this delicate network that you're actually seeing me, that you're hearing the words, that you're understanding it. And every time you use this network, these connections get stronger. You're constantly creating those brain circuits that allow you to make meaning of the world. You're creating your brain circuits which create your reality. Now this growth of brain circuits can be seen in this research with some monkeys. This is a monkey's hand and it just touched the fingertips of the monkey a few times every day. It was a very benign experiment. And this is how the brain responded to the touch before the experiment. Uh, this is the, how the brain responded to touching the second and third digit. After doing this for a number of months, this is how the brain responded. Can you see this? What's happening is now there's a greater part of your brain which is responding and processing what's coming from, in this case, the fingertips. This is what we're constantly doing every moment of our life. When you're working on your drive out at the driving range, what you're actually doing is reprogramming your brain. You're getting networks in your brain so you can have that perfect drive. Now the point here, and this is especially important for students, is all experiences change the brain. That means when you're in class and you're studying and you're learning processes and details, you're changing your brain to be able to remember those. But everything is changing the brain. You stay up two or three nights. You're under, you take an extra heavy load one semester. You're under incredible strain, pressure for the entire semester. This is also creating circuits. And what kind of circuits are these? Unfortunately, high stress fatigue leads to something called downshifting. What you do is you use this back part of the brain. This is the screen of the mind, just like the screen here, which is having the PowerPoint slides on it. There's a part of your brain where what's going on right now is just constantly cycling. And your motor system is active. What you do is you're able to see the world, respond to the world. This is a stimulus response mode of functioning. This is what happens when you wake up, you open up one eye and you look at the clock. Oh no, you're late. You jump up, you get dressed, you run to class, you sit down, and you forgot your homework. <laughs> or maybe you stay up all night studying, and you go to class, and you go to sleep. What's happening is under this type of thinking, you're leaving out that part of the brain the, which does the judgment, the planning, the decision making, this frontal executive system. This is the CEO of your brain. This is where David Lynch is in your brain. <laughs> All the possible inputs that can happen come to the front part of the brain and it makes into one very beautiful output. What happens under high stress is this part of the brain is not connected in. The circuits that you're making actually ignore this part of your brain as we see here. This is looking at brain metabolic rate, just how active the brain is. 
This is looking at the bottom of the people's brain. So here's the front, here's the back, their noses would be here. This is a normal person. Now this isn't a student over here. This is actually a violent criminal. And what you're looking at is functional lesions. That means when the criminal is thinking, these parts of the brain are not very active. What's done here is a threshold is put on the activity of the brain, and if it's too low, it just doesn't show it. So what we see here is there actually is brain tissue, but this part of the brain is not engaged when the person is thinking and making decisions and interacting with the world. There was a question about abuse and what that does to the brain. This is what it does to the brain. This is actually due to very high level of mental, physical abuse, drug, violence, like that. So what and can build frontal circuits? Transcending. This process of taking the, main, the mind from point value boundaries to quieter and quieter levels of mental functioning to that state where the mind is completely silent. What we find is the frontal areas of the brain are actually activated. They're more integrated. And by doing this over time, you bring this out into activity. So the violent criminal here, once they learn to meditate and start activating these areas, will actually be looking more like this. We haven't done that research, but we have done looking at their performance. And prisoners, well, number one, when they leave prison, they don't come back. There's a 40% decrease in recidivism rate. They just stop violating rules in prisons, they begin to act more as though they're thinking and planning in a very thoughtful way. Okay, enough talk. Let's look at EEG. Here we have Shane Zisman. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> and what we're going to be seeing is the real-time electrical activity going on in Shane's uh, brain at this very moment. Very good. So this is Shane's brainwaves right now. Now this very front top, that's um, over the eyes. You can blink three times, Shane. One, two, three. Very good. This is a signal coming from the movement of the eyes. It's actually on the outside of the skull, and that's why it's so much higher above the EEG. Now what we see here is technicolor, but Shane's brain is not in technicolor. <laughs> and here we see a brain laughing here. Uh, let's look at just one signal, and that will help us go more deeply into what is happening inside. So what we have here is, this is from the front of the brain. Now this is a second here. You notice this very fast activity going on. It's going up about 20 times per second. This is the fast activity of the brain processing, uh, thinking, experiencing. We're going to add one other signal. This one is going to be in the back. So this top one is the front, this bottom one is the back. This is what the brain is doing when 700 people are looking at you. <laughs> what, this is the back part of the brain. This is vision. The back part of the brain is taking in all of the lights and the colors, deciding what the picture is out there. Then it sends it to the front part of the brain, and the front part of the brain tries to decide what to do with it. Now the point I want you to notice is just how different these two signals are. There's very little similarity between the up and down of this signal and the rising and falling of this signal. Next, we'll see what EEG is like when Shane closes his eyes. So you can close your eyes, Shane. This is very good. Notice, now this is the back. Remember what the back was? That's right, that's vision. Everything that falls on your retina actually streams to the back of the brain and keeps this part of the brain really, really active. All Shane has done is close his eyes. You've cut all that information going to the back of the brain. And this is what you see. This is rhythmical alpha activity. It goes up and down 8 to 12 times per second. And this is a signature of the brain which is restful and alert. This part of the brain is, isn't processing anything. The eyes are closed, but you're awake. You're, you're, you can process, you can think. Notice up here in the front, the EEG is still very fast, it's very active. That's because even though the eyes are closed, this whole mental chatter is still going on, thinking, evaluating, like that. So you can open your eyes again, Shane. What we'll do now is we'll start from eyes open, and then we'll have Shane close his eyes. He'll begin transcendental meditation practice. 
what I want you to do is particularly look in this top lead, the front, we we'll begin to see that signature of restful alertness, that alpha activity in the front of the brain. Good, Shane, so you can begin TM practice. This has been about 16 seconds, but notice already, notice here is this rhythmical alpha activity, which before we saw in the back is now seen in the front of the brain. Even though we have only two signals here, this is representative of what's happening over the entire brain. And this restfully alert signal is that signal of transcending. Now we'll take just another minute. We'll continue to watch the EEG of transcending. Notice this, notice the amplitude, notice the, the amount of this, the density of this activity in the front, also the back. And also follow the signal going up and down. You notice it going up and down here in the front. Notice it's going up and down very similar in the back. This is what coherence is when the rising and falling of the signal in one part of the brain corresponds, correlates with the rising and falling of the signal in another part of the brain. This is that mark of total brain function, that mark of restful alertness, where there's silence, there's wakefulness, and this becomes the basis for clearer thinking. Very good, Shane. So now you can stop, stop meditating. And then as he opens his eyes, we're seeing the fast activity again of a brain which is actively processing. So let us go back to what this all means because the whole value of practicing TM is it leads to an experience inside, but that leads to a specific style of brain functioning. And swinging the brain back and forth allows you to have that style of functioning brain during meditation, during activity. And this is very valuable. What will your brain be like when you graduate from college? We've asked that question. We've created a brain integration report card to answer it. <laughs> what this actually charts is growing brain integration in activity over time. Um, we're actually administering this to our first year students at Marisha University of Management when they come in as freshmen and then when they like throughout their college career, but also as seniors. Because the information that you get in your class, unfortunately, is going to be <laughs> obsolete. 80% of it will be obsolete in five years. So <laughs> that's your four years of college education. <laughs> so what you want to do is something which will be lasting. And what is lasting is that quality of brain connections which underlie clear thinking, clear planning. So I'd like to leave you with a thought. This is going back to the Wizard of Oz motif. This is the end of the Wizard of Oz. and. Uh, here we have the, the wizard, and here we have the scarecrow. Do you remember what the scarecrow wanted? A brain. He wanted a brain. He went through all of these trials to get a brain. So here he is at the end, and what is the wizard giving him? A piece of paper. This is my recommendation to you. Don't be content with just getting a piece of paper from your college education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shane. Thank you very much, Fred. I'm going to invite David back up in a moment to finish taking your questions on film and meditation and creativity. You know, it takes a bit of a trained eye, I realize, to kind of see this thing about two different areas of the brain moving in sync like this. But it's amazing when you do see it. It's not something you find in any state of consciousness apart from this state of unbounded inner wakefulness. And when that happens, parts of the, when the whole brain is engaged and functions in an integrated way, you're enlivening the brain and personality holistically, including parts of our person, parts of our 
mind and body, that are never used or rarely used. And we saw this in maximum security prisoners with the so-called functional holes in the brain. Those holes in the brain were up here. This is our CEO, supposed to be our rational filter against primitive, aggressive, impulsive, violent behavior. You can take an inmate who is, you know, with severe, uh, not well adjusted socially, with a tendency to go back to prison again and again, and you can teach them something as simple as this technique to dive within and experience the true nature of the self. And very, very quickly, the brain restores its balance functioning, and the bottom line is, in this case, people don't go back to prison. I just want to share one really, really short but incredible story which left a big impression on me. This is a French-speaking country in Africa, Senegal. They had a severe crisis in the prisons with overcrowding and almost daily riots. And part of that was because the rate of return to prison, the recidivism rate in Senegal was 96%, which is high even by U.S. standards. <laughs> so perhaps out of nothing but sheer desperation, the Minister of Justice said, all right, we'll introduce instruction in Transcendental Meditation in our prisons on a voluntary basis, but sure enough, within a very short time, every prison inmate and virtually every prison guard learned TM because it provided relief in those pressure cookers of stress. What happened was within 14 weeks, the rate of return to prison dropped from 96% to 6%. And within about four months, a third of the prisons had closed through lack of customers. And there is the most incredible videotape of the president of the country seated in the Minister of Justice on national television, weeping in front of a national audience, saying how this very simple intervention transformed criminal justice in the country and really transformed the state of law and order in the entire country. So what David is doing right now with this foundation for consciousness-based education and world peace has potentially tremendous repercussions. He's trying to bring the experience of transcending to any student who's interested. Elementary school, junior high school, high school, college, graduate school. And we're starting, for example, at American University in Washington, D.C., where we were a few weeks ago. 500 students are starting there. It's going to be four credit and as part of a university res research project on improved student performance, student happiness, student health, and also reduction of what's called ADHD and many stress-related learning disorders, which are very present at the college level today and an epidemic among younger people. And so far, there hasn't been a real cure for it apart from medicating the kids, hoping they'll behave, <laughs> with no real knowledge of what the long-term side effects of these psychoactive drugs are. Not good, probably. So David is doing this, he's got tremendous momentum, and he's got an ulterior motive. And the ulterior motive is world peace. Now, world peace is not a golf ball-sized idea. You know, it's a David Lynch-sized idea. But we have a way to do it that is very practical and extensively scientifically researched. The whole idea is to bring inner peace to create peaceful people for a peaceful world. And the philosophy is pretty simple. You can't have a green forest without green trees. You can't have a peaceful civilization without peaceful people. But it's more powerful than that. There is an incredible and powerful, scientifically proven, spillover effect of meditation. We have an effect on each other. Inevitably, we have an effect on our loved ones, our friends, on our work environments, on an entire campus, or even a city, if enough people are involved. And particularly, interestingly, when those meditators are practicing their meditation in a group, there is a natural amplification of the spillover effect of meditation when practiced as a group. And it works just as you would expect it would, just like two loudspeakers. If you move them together, if those speakers are producing the same sound, if it's a monaural signal, you get four times the volume of a single loudspeaker, 
or three loudspeakers give you nine times the volume of a single loudspeaker. The power grows as the square of the number of loudspeakers. It's called constructive interference or the coherent summation of amplitudes. It's true of any wave phenomenon. If we as individuals in experiencing pure consciousness, the unified field, are creating a little ripple, an impulse, on the level of the unified field that underlies and pervades us all, if you put several people together and they all create a ripple, those ripples add to become a tidal wave of unity and of peace. And it works. The 52 studies in the world's foremost scientific journals showing the remarkable power of peace, of this spillover effect of meditation. And that's why we've started in Washington, D.C., to bring some sanity and peace <laughs> to that stress-ridden city. <laughs> so just to summarize, this 500 starting at American University and neighboring universities in Washington, D.C., is building to become a university of world peace. To counterbalance this global proliferation of military academies and graduate war colleges, all dedicated to advancing the art and science of war. Now, in my opinion, long ago, we came to the point of diminishing returns when it came to advancing the science of war. So let there be one university, at least in the world, dedicated solely to the prevention of war, to the promotion of peace, and to creating a new profession in the world. Not a soldier, but a professional peacemaker, people with the ability and responsibility to prevent war and to promote peace. So this is what we're doing. We're trying to create larger and larger groups of peace-promoting meditators, as well as individual meditators everywhere, anyone, any student, anywhere, who wants to experience this phenomenon of diving within and experiencing the field of unity and the field of peace. So to come and answer your questions on film or consciousness or his foundation or meditation, please welcome back David Lynch. How y'all holding up? Good, I hope. Yes. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, in what ways has transcend transcendental meditation uh, unlocked and affected your own creative side in being a successful director, painter, and photographer? And what advice do you offer to those emerging artists um, in unlocking their own subconscious creativity? Um. For, for me, uh, it's two things. The ability to uh, catch ideas. Um, it's there all the, all the time, but it's, it's the, uh, I feel that, that when the container of consciousness expands, you can get ideas at a deeper level. You can get ideas that are, that are bigger. It's like fishing. The little fish swim at the surface, and the bigger fish swim deeper. And I want to catch, you know, bigger ideas. And I want to be able to understand those ideas. And I want that intuition, you know, to grow, to, you know, uh, see, to the, the thinking and, and, and uh, feeling to go to a knowingness, a knowingness. And, and to be able to solve those problems that come along. The, the, the other side of it is, anxieties and fears and these and anger tension these things no longer have the power that they had instead you can still be very sorrowful but you can't hold on to it you can still get angry but you can't hold on to it life just gets too enjoyable it's too enjoyable and this is the, the greatest thing for creating if you're depressed really depressed you can't really get out of bed. The world is dark. It's horror. If that lifts, think what you can do. Anger, you want to have an edge in art. You want to be able to have, you know, um, your own strong voice. You can still be for something a hundred million percent. 
you know, and have, you know, a power. You don't lose an edge. You don't get laid back and become a hippie. It's, it's, you don't, you, you don't just go into sweetness. It's a, a power grows with this, a, such a power and a clarity and an energy to do. And this is so good. I, I just, you know, I, I see people who, um, one night I saw a high school play in Iowa with, in a school that had consciousness-based education. Consciousness-based education is the same education everyone gets with the added bonus that the student learns to dive within and unfold that self, that pure consciousness. And I was, was told, I'm, it was a cold and rainy night, I was told I was gonna see a high school play, and I thought, man, it's gonna be a very long night. <laughs> and uh, I was sitting in the middle of this little theater, beautiful little theater, and out on stage came students. They weren't actors, they weren't professional actors, they were putting on a play. I was never more blown away I thought it was better than a Broadway production because what I saw was consciousness on these faces, a lively, glowing consciousness, such intelligence, timing, humor, right on the money. And you don't worry about these students. They're self-sufficient, filled with this, kind, loving each other. The schools in what, I, I'm getting really wound up, I'm sorry, but <laughs> what I'm trying to say is it's, Consciousness flowing is something for human beings. Consciousness flowing, it's so beautiful. And there it is, and why not go get it? It makes things so beautiful. It's against nothing, it's for everything, and it's us. Hi there, my name is Margo. Um, I'm an artist, so I've been really curious about where ideas come from. And um, I've been doing some reading on creativity that it sounds like I've been reading about the same things that you're talking about. I've been looking at a guy called named Ro Rolf Fosti, who talks about theta state. I think it's similar to what you're talking about. He says it's where the brain is humming between four and 12 hertz. Just you're on the awake side, but you're very low down there in the energy. And um, he was saying there's actually so many ways that you can get into that state. He talks about meditation. He also talks about, you know, the surrealists use drugs. Thomas Edison would lie in his chair with ball bearings in his hand, and if he fell asleep, the ball would hit the a pie pan underneath and make this noise um, and, and get him back on the consciousness side. But I was wondering if you'd found any other ways uh, to enter into theta state besides the meditation. I, once I s had my first meditation, I realized that one day while I was daydreaming, I had transcended because my first meditation was uh, uh, similar, uh, but my first meditation was more powerful than that, but it was the same sensation of transcending. People can transcend without transcendental meditation, but with transcendental meditation, you can transcend you know, they don't know how, you don't know, I didn't know how I transcended that before. Mm -hmm. This way you transcend many, many times or long times, every single day, rain or shine, auto, you know, the, no worry about it. It always happens. It, it's a technique that will get you to that ocean of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's transcending, experiencing that deepest level. Now, I would like to ask, um, uh, Dr. Fred Travis to comment on, on the drugs for the same experience or the 12 uh, hertz uh, uh, thing because I don't know and I want, I, I got to. Thank you. Yeah, I was curious because I'd had that too. I w used to live in Italy and they'd have a huge pasta meal in the middle of the day and afterwards I would just be like in food coma on my desk and I had so many ideas at that time of day, and then I didn't I, realize. I know, that pa I know pasta isn't <laughs> transcending. It's awfully good. <laughs> now, they say you can transcend on any sense, and so if you maybe chewed pasta for many, many years and got it refined and refined and refined, you would transcend on the, on the sense of taste. But let me ask uh, Dr. Travis. So just shortly on the drugs, the uh, of use of drugs may give you the awareness that there's something more, but in the process of having that experience, what it actually does is it injures the
the nervous system, so it takes you further away from having that experience in an innocent way. In terms of Thomas Edison, this experience of that we experience between thoughts during transcendental meditation is an underlying field which underlies all states of consciousness. So actually between waking and sleeping, you go through that, between sleeping and dreaming. Uh, many great artists, maybe many people here have had insights just as they're waking up from sleep. You're coming from a whole different place at that point. And actually it's interesting, the EEG, what the brain is doing at their junction points looks similar to what happens during TM. And why is it that the mind is able to have ideas when you're in that state? Because that's the, the curious part about it. Because the ocean can have waves. So that field of unity can also rise up in waves. Thank you. Thank you uh, all for coming here and spending so much time with us tonight. Uh, I have a very practical question from my wife, Karen, who's a very practical person. Uh, do you meditate at specific times? And I think for many of us, there are so many demands on our lives, it can be hard to even find time. And we hear about Hollywood schedules of 16-hour days, and don't people get mad at you for saying, I have to take a meditation break? Um, I've been meditating 32 years and have never missed a meditation. And you can meditate anywhere. You, you can meditate in an airport. If you're, if you're out in work, I meditate at lunch. I meditate before I go to uh, go shooting, if I'm shooting. And then at lunch, I go in and, and, and meditate then. And if I haven't meditated you know, long enough, I'll meditate again when I finish. And um, I've been places where uh, there's no, no meditators around, but I ask for you know, a quiet room, and it's very surprising. People kind of like it, and they say, oh, yes, yes, well, I'll find you a very nice, quiet place and protect you, and I go in and, and meditate away. And we waste so much time. Once you add it, you know, and then just go about your business and have a routine. I meditate in the morning before breakfast and then in the evening before dinner. That's the, 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 the good time. Thank you. So i just read you this thing. If you're interested in any of this, learning more about it, learning Transcendental Meditation, uh, you can just fill out this, this card. And I'll, I will be in touch with you, or the Foundation will be in touch with you. May everyone be happy. May everyone be free of disease. May auspiciousness be seen everywhere. May suffering belong to no one. Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you.